This time, on 20 Minutes Into the Future, Plutopia News Network investigates Holochain. Arthur Brock devotes his time to projects that he believes support and accelerate the harmonious evolution of humanity. He recently led a series of Holochain workshops in Austin and took some time for a couple of interviews with our Plutopia correspondents, Benjamin Bradley and Tom Brown. Tom begins with the discussion of Holochain and privacy. Art, uh, I wanted to uh, un understand a little bit about uh, privacy in Holochain. Uh, security expert Bruce Schneier says that privacy is often important when there's a disparity of power. And um, so I was curious, what kind of uh, facilities does Holochain have to uh, help uh, privacy in, the, in, that, in that context? Cool. Um, yeah, I think of privacy and secrecy as distinct, so I want to address them distinctly. Um, and just because we don't always have shared language about this, I want to say what I mean. Privacy for me is like at the poker game where you get to decide who comes to the table. And secrecy is like what cards are dealt face down versus face up or, you know, like the, that the data is hidden. Um, at, but uh, that there's a group of people that have been included in the table, they can actually, they may be able to see that a card was, was dealt, but not what the card was. That's secrecy for me. So on Holochain, we deal with a bunch of these, these levels um, and differently than uh, blockchain, um, but let me also say differently than centralized systems, which kind of assume that you can lock people out of the computer and have everything be private because Holochain is a dis decentralized and distributed system, um, it isn't everything is private kind of space, right? It's already a different sort of space. So um, first of all, a Holochain application is itself a private peer-to-peer -peer network. But that can be private in the same way the internet is private. Like you have to get an IP address to talk on the internet but that's not necessarily a hard thing to do. So getting basically the code, the source code for that Holochain app is what you would need to be able to talk on that Holochain, to be able to run that Holochain. And then it would give you the, um, the means that you need to be able to encrypt your communications with other people on the network. So that's the minimum sort of level of privacy you can set higher thresholds for people to join that private peer-to-peer -peer network. So you could have invitation codes or KYC requirements or you know, signing away your first born, born child or you know, whatever kind of how high you want the threshold to be for being able to join a space, you can set up in the validation rules for when you register your address, basically. So that's the first layer of privacy is who's in the room or who's at the table, right? Then we have the fact that in, in Holochain, distinct from blockchain, in Holochain, everybody kind of has their own hand, right? They've got cards in their own, own hand. And so some of those cards, like we were saying, could have been dealt face up, some could be felt dealt face down, like let's say you're doing Texas Hold'em kind of style, right? Where everybody can see some shared information. Um, but some of them are face down and you can't see that other information. That's secrecy. Um, because we don't have one big chain, people make the state changes that they make to their own chain. And you can write private entries or you can write public entries. Public entries are automatically shared to the table. They're automatically shared to the distributed hash table, shared space. Um, private entries stay on your chain. They are not shared with others unless you selectively actively do so. So you could even use private entries to self notarize information. For example, like here's this sketch that I just did of an invention. I take a photo, I commit it privately to my private chain. The hash entry, the header for it becomes visible. You could publish that header, have other people sign it, but they've never seen what that was the hash of. Okay. And later, you could use that photo as proof that you had done this before and it hashed it. Other people notarized the hash, signed the hash, 
but you self-notarized basically by doing that because you can do that with a private entry. Um, blockchain accomplishes a lot of this stuff with cryptography, like they want to encrypt things out on the chain. I, you certainly have that option with Holochain as well. You could encrypt things that you put to the DHT, but um, I would discourage you from thinking, that's why we actually call that entry type public, we would discourage you from thinking that it's private when you put it there. Because we assume that all cryptography will at some point be broken, whether that's by quantum computing or something else. So if you didn't really mean to put things to an immutable public space, you probably shouldn't put it to an immutable public space. Right. Okay, so my, my takeaway is there, there is a facility to, when you push out some history to, to the DHT that um, uh, you, you can keep that uh, information confidential from others. You can keep it confidential only to people in your network. Like if you're running a, a Slack team, for example, only right. the people on your Slack team okay. are seeing the conversations, okay. right? That's a private peer-to-peer -peer encrypted network. Um, if you do a direct message inside of a Slack team, right, that wasn't put to the, to the DHT. Now, only the party that you're messaging with can see the conversation. Okay. Because um, that, if you choose to store it, is stored on your private chains, not on the DHT. Okay, yeah, that sounds great. Th thank you very much for the, the answer. Later in the session, Benjamin Bradley and Arthur have an in-depth discussion about Holochain. Arthur, first I wanna thank you so much for coming down to spend some time with us and share your knowledge and your experience with us. It's been very educational so far and I look forward to the conversation continuing. Awesome, thanks Benjamin, it's good to be here. So this uh, mini conference was convened to talk about Holochain and some of the technologies that have uh, inspired its creation. And it's been interesting that um, we've spent a lot of time talking about some of the bigger picture paradigms that inform the direction of that technology. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about some of the roots of uh, your experience, what inspired you and put you on this trajectory to develop this software? Um, yeah. The context for a lot of this work, it comes out of something called the Metacurrency Project, which is really about us going beyond currency, about uh, going beyond money at the very least, and even the the currencies above the currencies, the meta currencies. So we use the word currency funny, not just to mean money, which many times in English people equate the two. We think of it more from its Latin roots to flow, like correre, to run or to flow. So it's current see, like the ability to see flows, the symbol systems that we make. So for me, the work is, is <laughs> it's rooted in even behind that, there's some sort of deeper, even spiritual levels of, of what this really comes from in terms of a, a commitment to nourish life, to build upward spirals, and uh, what are the patterns that build those upward spirals. And uh, it, it turns out that uh, currencies are really useful for managing currents, patterns of flow, and uh, that, at least for living systems, it's the flows that make them alive, and it's the flows that determine their health. And so our ability to, uh, to manage those flows um, is, or to enhance them, or to grow those flows, is like, that's the game. And so uh, Metacurrency Project, set out to understand these patterns of flows and to help share the learnings that we had along the way. And then we started building tools. We started building this thing called Scepter, which is short for Receptor, Receptor-based computing, really to try to help build a collective intelligence quantum leap for mankind, like for us getting better at coordinating on scale instead of like poisoning the planet and killing each other. Um, and uh, 
Holochain is one small part of that, and that's kind of our main focus right now, something to, to go head to head against blockchain, but as a more sustainable or enlightened kind of alternative. And it really, you can tell that it was designed from a different paradigm than, than blockchain. So you're starting out observing the flows in the world and your environment, noticing that they're out of sync, out of balance, developing some unhealthy patterns and looking for ways to influence those flows in a way that's more healthy for the whole system. Yes, the, the game of building healthy flows that nourish upward spirals instead of extractive or exploitive or erosive flows that create downward spirals is kind of the, the for me, the fundamental ground of being behind all of this. What nourishes greater possibilities, what sucks them dry. How much of the impact or the result of a system comes from the design of it versus the use of it? So a tool by itself could be said to be agnostic of the way in which it's used. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure that all tools are quite that agnostic. Certainly, some you can use a tool to build something or to destroy something. Like there's how you wield the tool makes a big difference. Um, but we look at it. We look at our sort of model of change. We use this metaphor of a ladder. We have the two rails of the ladder and rungs that that go across it. And for us, there's both the sort of the shift in the awareness or consciousness and the embodiment in a tool that you can use. If you go off and have some breakthrough workshop, seminar thing this weekend and think your life is going to be all different and then you go back to work and do the same things every day, your life probably isn't going to change all that much. Um, you need some ways for those new patterns, those new insights to be embodied in your life and if you give somebody new tools and they don't have a, a higher consciousness to use them with they'll just use the new tools to do the old things so we're, we're not saying that tools are the magic answer but there are certainly some things that you can do with certain tools and some things you can't do with certain tools and that there are some tools that will tend to be erosive, you know, no matter what. If, if what you have is a, a spray washer, power washer, you know, to, to remove paint from surfaces or whatever, you're probably not going to be very effective to use it to use it in an additive way, right? And so part of our intercept course with blockchain is because we see some patterns encoded in the blockchain that pretty much are only erosive. And we wanted to create, for the, the people who have good intentions in that space, we wanted to give them some better tools as an alternative. So the nature of the tool itself kind of describes what that tool itself can be used for. So with that in mind, what this project came out of Scepter. What is the paradigm that is underlying Scepter? How is it different from other projects? So in Scepter, we were trying to build increased capacities to coordinate on large scale, but with a focus... Human coordination. Human coordination, yeah. To so you mentioned that one of the projects that you've been inspired which uh, has formed the direction of this technology chain is Scepter. Can you speak a little bit about what that is? Yeah, Scepter is a platform for us, which you could say is a rebuild of the existing computing platform, um, but oriented upon, on receptive capacity, which kind of means it is the feminine version of computing instead of the masculine version of computing. And uh, we didn't really necessarily mean for it to be that way. 
but because we were focused on composability and adaptability, uh, it turned out that this receptive capacity to receive an as of yet unknown thing, rather than assume that everything is known and can be stated, which sort of comes out of the masculine side of computing, uh, gave us a much higher resilience, flexibility, um, much less brittle and tending to break. And so we have all kinds of stuff wrapped up in there in terms of self-describing protocols, low-level semantics, um, you know, the non-local synchronization, which is kind of what the piece that Holochain came out of. Um, there's just a lot of things built into Scepter to solve problems differently for how we coordinate with each other on scale. Okay, so let's break that down a little bit. You say it's a different uh, technology stack, or I forget the words that you used. Platform is what I was... A different but yeah, it is platform. also a... Is that like a different operating system that I would install instead of Windows or Mac? I'd have a Scepter operating system? We expect that Scepter wants to become an operating system. At first, it's more just like a tool set for running applications inside of. Um, and, uh, but yes, it will probably become an operating system at some point because its capacities around the protocol stack and interfacing with different, different systems are very much like an operating system. One, it, it's easy to define the protocol and then be able to have anything within it speak that protocol. So is there a earlier stage of Scepter now that would run within an existing operating system? Yeah, so far Scepter is really just a proof of concept or prototype phase. We've built it in C. Um, it has within it self-describing protocols and Semtrex, um, which is semantic tree regular expressions because all the low-level data is stored in semantic trees. Semtrex turns out to be a universal protocol parser for us, so any way that you want to express a protocol in terms of Scepter, Semtrex can parse it. What's a semantic uh, tree? Semantic tree is, uh, in Scepter, you, the data is semantic. You can't just store a structure like an integer. You can store a street address or a shoe size or a... Uh, an age or something like that, right? You, you have to give it the semantic context of what's being used. And if you weave that low level semantics in, you don't have to keep recreating it at higher levels. We have this process in computing where we tend to strip things of semantics and then try to reinsert them again. And we do this again many, many levels. You would think that we would just leave the semantics embedded, but we don't. In Scepter, we do. So all of the data that's stored actually has that meaning inherently built into the That's right. Structure. It's connected to a definition for that what semantic application you're using. It's, it, uh, it's part of why, uh, and then it's also stored in trees, right? So it's part of why it's easier for us to build a um, universal parser for any protocol is that if you already have the semantics, then you don't have to, to lex the, the system, meaning you don't have to go and find all the keywords and try to figure out what's what. And if you already have the tree, then you don't have to go and try to construct the structure of the meaning. You, you already preserved both. And um, we just run everything using semantic trees, including code we just run it as a self-reducing tree. The tree eats itself down to its result. Hmm. What were the protocols that you described? You, you mean Semtrex? And it had, Scepter uses a nature of protocols. Self-describing protocols, yeah. So, um, Scepter is built on our principles of um, carrier signal protocols between agents, um, which allows us to identify a pattern of change and transformation that can be used across many different layers. So right now in the computing world, 
we have device drivers that have certain protocols, we have the underlying memory storage systems that have certain protocols, we have the disk drives, and then we have network protocols, we have layers of network protocols and transport. The protocol being and kind of the language that they use to talk to each other. Structure for meaning, the structure for communication. Like we're speaking right now in English protocols, right? Um, and in, in, in even a meta protocol that's a little bit of like an interviewer protocol for how you might ask questions and get answers. And mm -hmm. um, what we do with Scepter is we've abstracted that pattern such that we can reuse that pattern many times up and down the stack. And um, we can make protocols be live and pluggable and runnable and um, we can make them be chainable where you can tie them to each other, nestable where you build them inside of each other, which allows for a whole bunch of um, composition of these sense-making patterns, right, of information flows. So in a traditional computing system, a uh, protocol is fixed, it has to be known ahead of time, if I send you a file, uh, you have to have the program, the right program to open that up. So how would a Scepter system operate differently? For example, have you ever sent someone an email and said, I have these three questions I really need you to answer. And then you get a response back where they answered the first one and they kind of barely sort of indicated that they maybe noticed the other two, <laughs> but you didn't really get the answer that you're looking for. Um, it should be super easy to write a Q&A protocol on top of this, where it's like, okay, this is a question answer protocol. For each thing I identify as a question, an answer is required in your response, you know, and then actually have that pop up a different UI for them where there's not just a general box to type an answer in, but there's three boxes for, you know, one for each question. And until they've actually entered something in each box, they can't press send because they're required fields, right? That would be an example of a really simple ad hoc protocol that you could spend a few minutes defining. And then I could get a message from you that says, hey, you just got a message from Benjamin in the Q&A protocol. Would you like to install it? You know, hmm. and I, if I don't want to install it, it might just render it, for example, as YAML, like question colon, da 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 da, question colon. You know, my, so there may be a friendly rendering if you're just. So you can still read it. So I can still read it. But um, if I say, yeah, I trust Benjamin, let's install the protocol, then suddenly I have the correct UI and everything for interacting with the protocol, and your chances of getting each of your questions answered improves significantly. So it's almost creating new structure on the fly. We, well, we want it to be able to be that composable, but also that expressible. Like, why should it be so hard to get people to answer questions in an email? <laughs> That's so, silly. So does that uh, feature of the system also apply at lower levels? Yes. Yeah, when you look at this carrier signal protocol and uh, the structures of semantic alternation, you can see these patterns all the way down to, to bits and logic switches, you know, flip-flop circuits beneath it. Um, and these are, in fact, you can keep tracking those down because these patterns are the way nature works. These patterns go all the way down to, you know, molecules and atoms and subatomic particles. And um, we would assert that subatomic particles are speaking protocols that give you atoms. You know, and atoms are speaking protocols that give you molecules. And um, so when people get confused about, you know, is, are, is light a particle or a wave? Well, it depends on what protocol you're speaking with it, right? It's both. Hmm. So they compose together to form larger structures. Yeah. It sounds very organic. Was that part of the inspiration? Yes, Scepter is definitely modeled on living systems. It is for us where we derive the wisdom for how to scale and be composable and um, hopefully end up with something that embodies the right kind of wisdom for building coordinative patterns that don't get us stuck in some of the same kind of politics and power issues of the current world.
So Holochain is one piece of the Scepter project. Can you describe what Holochain does within that larger project? Yeah, in Scepter we had a notion of non-locality, just like in subatomic particles you can have entangled, entangled particles, right, where you have action at a distance, you make a change in one and the change happens at this other one as well instantaneously. Uh, for us, um, we're doing, we have an idea of a, a, a multi-instance receptor where I'm running an instance, you're running an instance, Bob, Alice, Carol, they're all running instances. Together, uh, that recept those receptors create a kind of unity. Um, and so we had a, a model for how to do data synchronization and create that unity of the multi-instance receptor. And what we did was we took out uh, basically that design and removed some of the scepter pieces like low-level semantics and that kind of thing to make a standalone version for Holochain. So Holochain shares the word chain with blockchain. Are they similar technologies? Uh, Holochain uses hash chains, which precede, you know, they predate blockchain. Blockchain is a special kind of hash chain of blocks of transactions. So there's similarity in that they're both tackling a problem of decentralized data integrity. Um, blockchain has mixed into it these tokens and I think many people have sort of, that part of the story has overshadowed the decentralized data integrity part of the, part of the story. So it becomes all about gambling with cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. Holochain does not have a currency built into it. Doesn't need one because it's much more efficient. We don't have to pay people to run it because uh, it's a much lighter weight thing. Um, but you can build currencies on top of it. We think Holochain needs to be value neutral like the internet protocol so that you can build things on top of it. Um, so it, it plays in a similar space and frankly we're hoping to capture some of the, the interest and energy and funding that go toward blockchain to redirect toward applications on Holochain that we think will scale better, be faster, cheaper, and healthier. So blockchain and Holochain are both can be thought of as distributed storage mechanisms. You're maintaining a body of data or a body of information which is consistent across all of the nodes that are interacting with that data. Um, you mentioned scalability. What are some of the other uh, functional benefits of Holochain? The orientation, like the where the design comes from, uh, is slightly different. So Holochain is agent-centric, blockchain is token-centric or data-centric. In general, you can solve similar problems, but you solve them from a different vantage point. It would be like we could define the rules of poker by uh, looking at the cards and do it from the vantage point of the cards that you have to start with 52 cards of these types and you randomize the sequence and you cut the order and then you remove the top card and put them in stacks of five or you know whatever the we could speak all about it from the perspective of cards and that you can turn that certain cards can go back into a discard pile that blah 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 we could speak about it all from the that perspective or we could speak about the game we could define the game from the view of agents, the dealer and players, and then players holding their hand and they can take particular actions. And you could potentially even get completely compatible games. You might be playing the game defined by cards, I might be playing it defined by agents, and we could be, as far as we could tell, playing the same game. Except that we're not exactly playing the same game. There are some things you can define differently like when you include agents in the conversation, you can say things about like no table talk <laughs> or whatever, right? Because now agents are a part of it, not just cards. Um, and so you get some differences in the levels, but you can solve many of the same problems. Sounds like it's really bringing that human element back into the platform. It is. Uh, so thanks, Art. 
This has been very informative and interesting. For folks who want to learn more about Scepter or Holochain, how can they get more information or get involved in the project? Holochain.org is a good place to start. Um, Holo.host is another aspect of it. That's the distributed hosting of Holochain apps. Metacurrency.org if you're interested in all the crazy design principles behind it all. Great. Thanks again for your time. Thanks, Benjamin. You've been listening to a series of interviews with Arthur Brock about Holochain. Special thanks to correspondents Tom Brown and Benjamin Bradley. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future.